Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our continuing Quest for Wisdom series. Um, we're coming to the last book we're going to look at in this series, which is the Song of Solomon. Um, fascinating book. Um, one of the books of the Bible that has suffered a pretty bad history of interpretation. And uh, to me, it still has those lingering effects even to today. And um, in multiple ways, we'll sort of address that as we go in, in the two or three sessions it'll take us to cover. Uh, but Song of Solomon is the last of the wisdom books um, in our focus here. And I want to talk tonight about a couple of things. Um, one being, uh, what does the title of the book mean? And uh, we'll sort of start there. And then we're, we'll talk about, uh, in addition to that, um, what exactly is this? What is, what is the song? How do we understand it? And that kind of thing. So two important uh, interpretive issues related to Song of Solomon. Uh, the title of the book comes in the very first verse, chapter 1, verse 1, which in my translation says, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Uh, some translations say the Song of Songs, which is to Solomon. And so uh, we begin there and ask the question of, of what exactly does that mean? Um, it may be something that is assumed, but uh, it could mean you know, several different things. Uh, the first part of it we pretty, pretty well know. Okay, so when it says the Song of Songs... Uh, that in Hebrew, the, the language of the book is a superlative, what we call a superlative. It's a way of saying, this is the greatest thing. And so the song of songs means the greatest song. Uh, you know, the number one hit, the greatest song ever is sort of the idea. So that part of the, of the title in the first verse is clear. It's it's describing this as the great song. It's the next part that there's differing views on, um, and I'm not sure exactly which of these views is right. I'm not sure um, that one or the other is uh, more important, uh, but it is something to discuss. So the Song of Songs, the greatest song, which is to Solomon. What does that part mean, to Solomon? To Solomon could really mean three or four things, okay? It could mean by Solomon. That is, it's telling us who wrote it. And that's probably the one that most people assume, that um, the Song of Songs is authored by Solomon. Very possible. Um, but it doesn't, that title doesn't... Uh, doesn't have to mean that. It could mean something else. For instance, it could mean to Solomon in the sense that this book is dedicated to Solomon. Someone else is the author uh, and they're dedicating it to Solomon. The language would allow for that as well. So it might be authored by him. It may be dedicated to him. It could also mean something like uh, to Solomon. It, it could mean something like it's concerning Solomon. That is, it's, it's about him. Um, Solomon is the uh, subject matter of the book. That could be the meaning of this. Um, and then lastly, the idea that, um, that to Solomon means something like, well, it's Solomonic. That is, it's in the wisdom tradition of Solomon. So this would be the idea that it's written after the time of Solomon, uh, but it is sort of the kind of thing he's associated with. Any of those four could be right. I'm not sure which one is 
the right one. Uh, we're just not exactly told. And I'm not sure it's the most important issue, uh, but it's normally something that, that uh, you address when you start talking about a book, who wrote it. So, you know, Solomon is mentioned several times in the course of the book. Uh, obviously here in verse one, his name appears, but also in verse five, for instance, of, of chapter one, where it's, it refers to the curtains of Solomon. Then there are references also in chapter three, which we'll, we'll look at in a moment, and uh, a couple of references in chapter eight. A couple of times Solomon is named in chapter eight, verses 11 and 12. Uh, the one in chapter three is interesting because it seems as if uh, there's this wedding procession that's going on and it almost presented like it's the wedding of Solomon. So three times he's mentioned in chapter seven, uh, I mean, excuse me, in chapter three, verse seven is the first place. So it says there, behold, it is the litter that is sort of the marriage train of Solomon and it talks about around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, which you might expect for a king. Uh, and then in verse 9, it says, King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. So he's mentioned there. And then finally in verse 11, go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. So again, it sounds almost like a wedding train kind of thing. And um, and that, that Solomon is involved in that. Uh, others who don't want to take it quite so literally as that. Um, excuse me, a phone just rang. Uh, <laughs> others who don't want to take it quite that literally suggests that, you know, this could be a metaphor using Solomon's name to describe whoever the groom is in this couple that's getting married. And so, and, and it's her speaking here, it's almost like she's calling him my Solomon or my king, you know. Remember in, in, in interpreting the Song of Solomon that, um, this is poetry, and that's really important to understand as we read the verses in this book. This is poetry. We have to read it as poetry, and so it could be a poetic device calling the groom Solomon. Maybe it's literally Solomon, but it could be, since it's sort of associated with Solomon, a way of praising the groom. One thing that happens between the man and the woman in Song of Solomon is they are constantly praising one another in very elaborate terms, in very colorful terms, in very poetic terms. And so that would make sense. Um, remember that Solomon is said to have written over a thousand songs. Um, when we started this study, this quest for wisdom, we read uh, in the book of Kings, about all the proverbs and, and, and songs that Solomon wrote. It says there that he wrote a thousand and five songs. So if that's the case, and it certainly is, and if he's the author here of the Song of Solomon, as some people believe, um, then this would be the greatest of his thousand and five. Because remember at the beginning, it uses that superlative calling this the song of songs, the great song, the song of all songs. So a little bit there on, on authorship and on the nature of the language. This is poetry. Let's keep it in mind as we, as we study. Let's talk a little bit more about what is this? What is this song uh, and how do we understand it? Uh, it's really more important than authorship, I believe. And so I'm going to um, suggest that this is what it appears to be on the surface. That is, it is a collection 
of love poems. Uh, these are songs, poems between a man and a woman who are at one point in the book on the verge of being married. I believe they get married and then they're rejoicing in their marriage, uh, all in a very highly poetic way, okay? But this is a collection of love poetry between them. And in fact, that is the way it was understood early on in the history of its interpretation. It's only later when different things were suggested about what's going on with this book. Uh, later on, in both Judaism and in Christianity, the book began to be treated and, and interpreted with a method called allegory. Um, allegory is where a, a, a book or a poem or something, it appears to be talking about one thing, but it's really talking about something else. It's a, a figurative way of understanding. And so it's not really, so we're saying that this book is a book of love poetry, and allegory would say it appears to be a book of love poems, but it's really talking about something else. And so in Judaism, uh, it was seen at one point as being a poem that described the love between God and Israel. Okay, so it's not really a man and a woman, uh, but it's really talking about God and his love for the nation of Israel. In Christianity, in later times, it came to be seen as a poem describing instead of the love between a man and a woman, it was the love between God or Christ and the church. Okay? And that, for a long time, was a dominant view of um, the Song of Solomon. That it, it isn't really uh, love poetry in the way we think of it, but it's love between God or Christ and his church. And that view is, I would say there's probably still a lot of people who think that way. Uh, it was very influential, and there are remnants of that view still today. So, if you have, for instance, an old edition of a King James Version Bible, and I have no problem with the King James, but if you would have an older edition, uh, sometimes up in the, I'll hold my Bible up here, up in the upper margins of the old KJV, there would be notations, little phrases that, that summarize the content of the page below. Um, usually just two or three word descriptions. Uh, if you look at an old King James like that in the Song of Solomon, it will say things like Christ's love for the church or the church's love for Christ. So it was suggesting that the, 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 uh, the compilers of that edition of the KJV were suggesting this allegorical view of, of Song of Solomon. To show you how influential that was, that view, uh, which I'm going to argue against, okay? Uh, but to show you just how influential that was for a long, long time, um, the language of, of Song of Solomon is found in a lot of very popular Christian hymns of, uh, we might say, bygone days. I mean, a lot of these songs we still sing, uh, but um, they're older songs now. And so, for instance, have you ever sung a song in your hymn book that had the phrase, Jesus Rose of Sharon? In fact, that's the name, I, I believe, of, of a hymn, Jesus Rose of Sharon. Where does that phrase come from? Well, it comes from chapter 2, verse 1 of the Song of Solomon, because it says there, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. That phrase, the second phrase you might be familiar with too, um, when it comes to Christian hymns. Um, chapter 2, verse 1 is something that the uh, 
the woman in Song of Solomon, the future bride, is saying to her lover, so she's, she's describing herself, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. She's using poetic symbols to describe her nature. Well, you see, if, if you believe that, that the Song of Solomon is really talking about Christ's love for the church, well, then you might, centuries later, writing a Christian hymn, take that beautiful poetry and apply it to Jesus. Jesus is the rose of of Sharon. Jesus is the lily of the valley. Um, so that's one example. Another, uh, another example is his banner over us is love. I remember there was a, uh, a song that we sang uh, when we were kids that had that phrase, his banner over us is love. That comes from chapter 2 verse 4 of uh, Song of Solomon. Again, it's the woman speaking, and she says, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Okay, so if you have the view that this is really talking about the love between Christ and the church, you take that phrase and you apply it to Jesus. His banner over us is love. Um, that, that phrase also appears in a, maybe a, a more well-known hymn, Faith is the victory. Um, one of the things uh, in that, one of the images in that hymn is chapter 2, verse 4, his banner over us is love. As I said a moment ago, Lily of the Valley, which I think is also the actual title of a Christian hymn, comes from chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, you may be familiar with the, the song Paradise Valley. Uh, Paradise Valley one of the phrases in that song comes again from chapter 2, verse 1. It, it says, In the midst of it, um, in the midst of it grows Sharon's perfect sweet rose. Um, and that again is language taken from the Song of Solomon using sort of this figurative approach. Um, there is a song, I don't know how familiar you are with this one. I, it wasn't very familiar to me. But there's a song called, I am his and he is mine. Uh, that comes from chapter 2, verse 16, where the I believe it is still the woman speaking. And she says, my beloved is mine and I am his. Okay, so uh, that song, I am his and he is mine. And I think the the hymn that was made from that, again, is talking about the, the Christian worshiper saying, Jesus is mine and I am his. And so you, you see how they're taking the language from that song. And then a, a, a more familiar song to us maybe is, I have found a friend in Jesus. You know that song? Um, that part of that song comes from Song of Solomon as well. Chapter 5, verse 10 of Song of Solomon says, my beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. Distinguished among 10,000. And in that song, um, I have found a friend in, in Jesus, we have this phrase, he's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul, right? And also he's called the lily of the valley in that song. So these are just examples of, you know, the great influence of the Song of Solomon, first of all, but also this particular interpretation of the song, um, which makes it an allegory of Christ's love for the church. I think that uh, that is the wrong way to understand the Song of Solomon. I don't think we have to tear these songs out of our books. You know, it's all poetry. So um, it's beautiful language and maybe... Uh, you can apply it in this way, but I'm just showing you how prevalent the influence is of this song you may not have been aware of. Probably if you counted up all the interpreters, people who are, have written and are writing commentaries on Song of Solomon that are studying it these days, most of them have moved away from this allegorical interpretation 
in favor of a more literal view of the Song of Solomon. That is, that it is what it appears to be, that it is love poetry between a man and a woman that are on their way to be married and eventually are married and then are celebrating their marriage afterwards. One of the reasons that a more literal view came to be more acceptable is the fact that uh, archaeologists and students of the ancient world began finding lots of literature like this from other cultures that existed at the time of Israel. For instance, down in Egypt, uh, they found this very kind of love poetry, this kind of genre of literature. Also in Mesopotamia, uh, where you have the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and so forth, they've discovered love poetry. Uh, there it's sort of focused on love between gods and goddesses, as you can imagine. Uh, but in Egypt, the, the love poems they found in Egypt are very similar to the one in Song of Solomon, where you've got the man and the woman speaking in sort of soliloquies, you know, where they, they, they talk for several lines and then the other responds. And, and the woman is called sister and the man is called brother, although they're really in a romantic relationship. It's a poetic way of expressing it. It sounds very similar to what you find in Song of Solomon. So that made scholars more comfortable with taking it more literally because you know, what they're saying is this was the kind of stuff people wrote at the time. Um, that's part of it. The major reason uh, that a more literal view is now in favor is that this, again, this is how the song presents itself. And I think we would all be sympathetic with the, the idea that when we're dealing with the Word of God and we're dealing with Scripture, you really need to have a good reason to call something figurative or to interpret it allegorically. There's not a lot of allegory in Scripture. There's a few spots, but it's not a common way of writing. And you need a really good reason like, for instance, the writer telling you that it's an allegory. Um, over in the book of Galatians, Paul uh, uses an allegory, and he says it's an allegory. But uh, the Song of Solomon never says it is. And so uh, I don't think those who interpret it allegorically have, have made the case. And so I want to take it more literally. Um, as long as we understand that it is poetry, okay? Um, and that that's certainly the case with this song. So we might wonder, why did this view become so popular um, and so dominant for so long? What was it that influenced people to, to want to read it in this highly figurative allegorical way? And uh, a simple answer to that is embarrassment, um, discomfort with the material. And frankly, in as, in, as the church became more, um, as church leadership became more uncomfortable with, with sex, with uh, even marriage and that kind of thing, um, as you've heard, heard the term asceticism arose in the church, that is um, trying to separate from from any of the works of the flesh or, or indulgence in the flesh at all, as that became uh, a requirement to be a preacher, as monks and monasticism developed, um, and they began um, interpreting scripture for people, this view began to dominate, that this is not what it appears to be. It's not really a man and a woman expressing their desire for one another, their love for one another. It is uh, a figurative way of describing God and his relationship with his people. Uh, they were, in other words, not comfortable with what the book said. Um, but there are a lot of reasons not to, 
to um, view it that way. And frankly, there are a lot of reasons not to be embarrassed by the song. And I think people are less inclined to be embarrassed by it today. Uh, but there was a time where, you know, this was um, just a common reaction. Remember Adam and Eve um, after they sinned. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, is, there's this interesting verse. I think it's sort of a parallel to the way people reacted to, to the song. Adam and Eve have been going along and enjoying one another and so forth, enjoying life in the garden, and they sin. They eat of the uh, forbidden tree. And it says, Genesis 3, verse 7, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Well, you know, you wonder, how did they not know they were naked? Well, they had never heard of clothes. Uh, but it says, you know, suddenly something happened. They sinned. Uh, their eyes were opened to something. They realized they were naked and apparently felt shame at that. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Um, it's almost the same kind of embarrassment that, that some in a bygone um, centuries had when they read Song of Psalm. It was sort of embarrassing to them. And they felt like they needed to, to come up with another explanation for what they were reading. And then, you know, just our world and the way it has corrupted a lot of relationships and marriage relationships and so forth, both in ancient times and in modern, uh, sometimes the world itself causes embarrassment at the, the kind of subject matter that we're dealing with here. But again, I, I reiterate this point. There, there are many good reasons not to be embarrassed by what we read in the Song of Solomon. And I just want to go through uh, four or five of those quickly and um, state the case. Uh, number one, God created these things. God created human sexuality. He created love between man and woman. He created desire uh, between the sexes. And you see that in Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Um, he creates Eve for Adam. When, when Adam sees her, he realizes she is something special, unlike the rest of creation, something special to him. And they marry, God being the officiant at the wedding, and the two become one flesh. And remember, it says that uh, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall be joined and become one flesh. God created all that. So this subject matter is from him. Uh, the world may corrupt it and spoil it, but God made it. And so we shouldn't be embarrassed by it. Number two, this desire that is expressed in a lot of what Song of Solomon is, is uh, the man and the woman expressing their, their longing for one another. Um, this is a gift from God. And it isn't something simply used to procreate or to... Um, to make children, you know, and that became almost the view in um, the early years of the Catholic Church. Um, the monks and so forth and priests promoted this idea, well, yeah, if you're going to have sex, fine, but that's just to make babies. That's, that's, not, that's not what it was created for, simply, but to experience love, joy, pleasure, all these things created by God. Those things are a gift from God. They're not to be embarrassed of. Number three, the song itself focuses on emotions, the emotions of love and not the mechanics. All right. So, you know, although the language is very sensual, um, it is never dirty. It is not pornography. Um, it is sensuality, it is a, a man and a woman expressing their desire and love for one another, talking about how good-looking one another are and, 
and praising one another's physical qualities. Yes, that's there, but it's really um, the love that drives that. And, and so that's what, um, you know, there's nothing to be embarrassed of with that. And so um, the song focuses on the emotions of love. A fourth thing is that that the song, uh, this love in the song is a mutual thing, is a mutual love. So just a couple of verses here. Chapter 2, verse 16 again, I think we read this earlier, where it says, My beloved is mine and I am his. You see the mutuality there. Uh, he is mine and I am his. They mutually have this feeling. It's not one dominating the other or uh, oppressing the other or abusing the other. It is a mutual thing. Also, we see this in chapter 6, verse 3, sort of a famous verse from the song, my, uh, I, am a, my, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Okay. In fact, a lot of jewelry is made uh, from that verse, especially from the Hebrew of that verse, uh, which we may talk about at some time. But uh, this, this love that is expressed between the man and the woman in the Song of Solomon is a mutual thing. Uh, it's not dominated by one or the other. And fifth, and the last point, this love is exclusive and committed. So this is not a fly-by-night thing. It's not a one-night stand. Um, they're not uh, involved with multiple partners, one after the other. This is monogamous. It is exclusive and committed, clearly, in the context of the song. And so, if you think about this um, from the minds who created, whoever it was that wrote it was a Hebrew, uh, was a, a, a Jew, an Old Testament believer, okay? That's the mind that, that created this. And for that mind, love like this in the ancient world was always married love, okay? Always. There was no exception to that. Anything else was sanctioned and punished. Uh, so go clear back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, the first marriage. But that's how it was always understand. If you're going to express this kind of thing for a man or the man for a woman, um, this is a committed thing. It's a lifelong commitment. It's a married commitment. Um, so there's nothing to be embarrassed of in the language. What's going on is between uh, a man and a woman. It's between an engaged man and a woman. It's between a married man and a woman. Uh, all this happens throughout the course of the song. And it's an attraction that's based on commitment. They're totally committed to one another. Uh, they're not uh, looking elsewhere for these things, but just one another. And the idea of faithfulness, fidelity, is a major theme throughout the Song of Solomon. Uh, two of the verses we've already read, chapter 2, verse 16, chapter 6, verse 3, and uh, one last one, chapter 7, verse 10. I am my beloved's, she says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. So it's always expressing this mutuality, this commitment, this exclusivity. Uh, that is a reason to read it for what it is. Uh, there's nothing to be embarrassed about in the context of, uh, of this song. And if, if we're embarrassed by it, it's because of the pressures of the world and the corruption of the world that has done that. Nothing in the text is embarrassing. And, uh, and I hope you'll see that as we look through it. There are a, uh, a lot of themes that keep coming back throughout the song. Um, equality is one. You might be surprised to hear that from an ancient text. But uh, throughout the book, um, the, the partners are in, in many ways are equal. Again, mutuality. Uh, they're both feeling this way about one another, commitment, which we talked about, 
They're committed to one another. They're exclusive to one another. Um, and, and the last one that I've mentioned is responsibility. That's a major theme in the book. There's this refrain. So again, uh, we're dealing with a song, right? The song of songs, the greatest song. And uh, there are several refrains. You know what a refrain is in a song. You know that part that keeps getting repeated. We have that in the Song of Solomon. And here is one of the refrains. Chapter 2, verse 7 is the first one. Uh, this is the woman speaking, and she's talking to a group that she calls the Daughters of Jerusalem. We might think of these as her wedding attendants, uh, probably from some friends of hers. She says, I adjure you, adjure means admonish, that kind of thing, or I call your attention to this, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field. Um, lots of animals mentioned throughout this book, gazelles a lot. But she says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. That same phrase from chapter 2, verse 7, comes back chapter 3, verse 5, and then in the concluding chapter, chapter 8, verse 4, where she says, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. This thing that uh, this man and woman are involved in, this expression of mutual love and desire, is not a thing to be taken lightly, to be jumped into too soon. They're being responsible. You see, they have made a commitment to one another. And as she teaches her friends, maybe her younger friends, her attendants about love, she says, this is not something that you leap into um, carelessly. Do not stir up or awaken love until the right time. One of the major refrains of the book. Um, so, couple of major issues, uh, authorship that we talked about at the top, but then just what is the song itself and how should we read it? We're suggesting that we should read it for what it is, love poem, love poems um, between a man and a woman that are committed to one another, that are getting married, that are married at some point in the book, and then are celebrating their marriage um, later in the book. Uh, next time we'll talk uh, about some different views about how the book is organized. So there's there's like a, a three character view and a two character view uh, that some people have come up with to try and describe all the different voices. We'll, we'll go over that a little bit and um, make a little bit of a, an adjustment on those things as we look at some of the verses more specifically. But it is a fascinating book. Uh, I sent out to you, if you're on our email list, a handout today uh, with an illustration. It should look something like this when you open it up or print it out. That is, um, it says, The Song of Solomon Illustrated for Our Literalist Friends. And it takes one of the texts of the book where the man is describing the woman and draws a picture if we take it 100% literally. So what does she look like uh, if everything that he says about her is literally true? It's not very flattering, you'll see in the picture, which just emphasizes the idea we're dealing with poetry. Um, you know, if, if you said to um, your wife, or your steady girl, or whatever, if you said something like your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, would she consider it a, a, a compliment? Uh, probably not, unless she understood you to be speaking figuratively and saying you have a powerful face, you know, or... Uh, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn lambs. Um, she might say, what? 
unless she understood Hebrew poetry and understood you'd be saying, you got white teeth. Or your hair is like a flock of goats. Try that one. Uh, you, you could probably come up with a better line, but it was a compliment then when spoken poetically. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those things as well. Glad you tuned in. I uh, encourage you to, to read through Song of Solomon, just eight chapters. Uh, but maybe some of the things that we'll present here will help you read it uh, a little more effectively. Hope you have a great week. God bless you. And uh, stay in the Word and, and continue your quest. We'll see you soon.